Good day, this is Jim Pytel from Columbia Gorge Community College. This is Digital Electronics. This lecture is entitled Analog to Digital Conversion Basics. If you remember from our previous lecture on digital signal processing basics, I introduced this block diagram right here. And what we're going to kind of talk about in this brief lecture is this section of the block diagram. And in actuality, we actually will kind of discuss a little bit of digital to analog conversion also. What this block diagram, if we refresh our memories here, a filter, it's going to remove unwanted input frequencies. So why are we going to go ahead and input noise if we don't want it? So we just go ahead and get rid of it, or potentially some high frequency components that we don't need. The sample, okay, what does this sample and hold portion of the block diagram do? Well, basically a sample. It converts the analog signal into a series of impulses representing the amplitude of the signal at a given instant. So basically, it's just looking at it every second, every half second, whatever the frequency you're looking at, and it's saying, okay, at that time, it is such and such value. The sampling rate, it occurs at a rate sufficient enough to define the input waveform. So remember our Nyquist sampling theorem discussion, you got to go ahead at a very minimum, sample it at twice the frequency of the highest frequency you wish to capture. Okay, what does the hold do? Well, for it to quantize the data, it should have a, probably help out if it wasn't changing. Okay, so you sample it and in the process of quantization, just hold it at that constant level. Don't vary. It. That's all the hold does. And what is quantization? Basically, you're assigning a binary code to that sample data, that sampled and held data. And one of the concepts that is not often mentioned in uh, some of these introduction to analog to digital conversion is this concept of range and granularity. Your digital multimeter is a classic example of range. There's an expected maximum. Think about a milliamp meter versus an ammeter versus an ammeter that's rated for 40 amps or 160 amps. There are certain ranges, you know, if you're using your ammeter on the 160 amp range, you're trying to measure 4 milliamps, it's not going to do a good job. The same thing goes for something that you're going to go ahead and let's say you've got a 20 milliamps maximum range and you're trying to measure 160 amps. You're darn right that ammeter is not going to work out very well because it's probably going to start on fire. This concept of range, you have to have previously defined the range with which you're going to quantize. For example, you know, a voltage waveform that's going from zero volts to 160, back down to zero, down to, excuse me, 100. 70 back down to negative 170 so on and so forth that's your range that's your expected range let's say you maximum out at 170 volts what i would do is i would assign the quantized value the maximum quantized value let's say i'm using a four bit system quadruple one i would probably assign the maximum for that range 170 being equal to four ones. Does that make sense? Whereas if I was to use this in a different application, let's say I'm going down to 100 millivolts is my expected maximum. If I was to sample this 100 millivolt waveform maximum, I would assign my range where my quantized value quadruple one is also equal to four once again the maximum of my range you can't use quantization for you can't use the same transfer function you learn about transfer functions in industrial controls but what is a transfer function in its basic form it's a sensor you know it's a certain amount let's say you're trying to take the analog data of pressure for a certain amount of deflection of that pressure plate there is a corresponding voltage or current signal that if you've got a maximum of 200 psi versus a maximum maximum of 50 psi, that range might be different. Um, to set up a proper DSP, you need to be aware of the ranges of those quantized values. Does that make sense? Uh, granularity. Granularity is potentially a uh, a little bit more difficult to discuss without the use of diagrams, and which I'm going to go to in a second here. But granularity, think about it. The more granular a beach is, probably there it is easier to walk on. For example, a beach with a bunch of boulders on it is not the smoothest type of beach versus a beach with a bunch of rocks on it versus a beach with a bunch of pebbles on it versus a beach with a bunch of sand on it. That's where people like to hang out because it's nice and smooth. Think about that in terms of bits. If you're defining, for example, a pressure transducer, you know, it transduces to create a range versus a pressure switch. What's a pressure switch? On or off? 
on or off. There is no value it's trying to produce. Whereas a transducer is trying to produce a value. Okay, pressure transducer is saying, okay, it's 160 PSI, and now it's 170 PSI, and now it's dropped down to 150 PSI. Okay, so uh, the granularity with which I try to represent that analog data, it's directly corresponded to the number of bits. The more bits you've got, the smaller you can break those chunks into, i.e. the smaller the sand on your beaches, so the smoother it is. So let's go ahead and look at some examples here of basic analog to digital conversion. Okay, we're going to go into some some specifics about analog to digital conversion methods, but right now we're just keeping at the basics. Okay, so here is a two-bit quantization of an analog waveform. So our analog waveform is in the upper left-hand corner here, and it's smoothly varying over time. And what we've done here in the upper right-hand corner is we've sampled it at a certain interval. We've taken a a zero sample right there, one sample, two, we're assigning the amplitude at that instant. And we're holding that and bringing it down to our quantization. So this is a two-bit quantization. And if you could think about it here, was what we're doing is we are putting it in four levels. If there is a value that occurs above here, but below here, assign it the value zero, zero. If there's a value that is above this line, but below this line, assign it the value 0, 1, so on and so forth, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. And as we can see, our 2-bit quantization only has four levels, and it gives us a very poor rendition of our original analog waveform. So how are we going to do that? Okay, what we're going to do is we're going to increase the granularity. How are we going to do that? Increase the number of bits. What we'll do is do a 3-bit quantization. And a word about range for this. This is the same analog signal. Let's say, for example, this is maxing out at like 8 volts. 8 volt maximum is represented by 1, 1. Whereas this could be also be an 80 volts maximum, where 80 volts is represented as 1, 1. It's still kind of the same shape of waveform, and it's still doing the same sampling, and it's still doing the same quantization, but realize 1, 1 represents 80 volts, whereas our previous example, 1, 1 represents 8 volts. So that concept of range and granularity when you're setting up these things, your expected values, know what to expect. I mean, the things that I harp about, basic electronic stuff, every single time you guys grabbed a DMM, what was the mantra that I had you guys repeat? Function leads range. What do you expect? So let's move on to a 3-bit quantization of the same waveform. Upper left, same waveform. Upper right, it's the same sampling. At those particular instants, it's looked at. What is the value at that instant? Okay, now things get different here. In this here, in this lower left hand here, what I've defined is eight different levels. Why is it eight different levels? Because now I'm using three bits. See how that granularity is allowing us to represent the waveform in a slightly more accurate representation compared to our previous one. A three-bit quantization leads to a lot more accurate representation of our original waveform. We can kind of see it now. It kind of looks the same. Previously, we were missing even that dip right there. Now we can kind of see that. Uh, it's a little bit more accurate representation. What have we also gained with this? We've gained some complexity and some storage there. You know, whereas previously we were storing it two bits, now we've got three bits. You know, go ahead and extend this out to four bits. What are we going to do here is we are just going to go ahead and increase the levels of granularity. We're adding another bit. Now I can define between incredibly, incredibly small levels here and get this quantized value. The sampling and holding is the same thing, except the fact that I've quantized it into 16 different levels now. And look how closely, how much more accurate our digitized version of this analog waveform looks like it. Okay, it looks a lot more accurate. And basically the summation of this whole thing is, is here. Here's our original waveform. On the left, we've got our two-bit quantized digital representation, our three-bit, and our four-bit. You can clearly see the four-bit is a much better representation of our original analog waveform. If we were to extend this out to five bits, six bits, 32 bits, I mean, just think about what I drew right here. That's a digitized representation of my analog hand movements 
on this tablet. So the more bits you get, the more uh, closer it looks to that original analog waveform. In addition, the more times I sample this, say for example, I'm increasing the frequency at which I sample this thing, the better and more accurate the representation of this waveform will be up to a certain limit here. Again, that is the basics of analog to digital conversion. We'll go into some of the methods. Um, like I said, there is a little bit of digital to analog conversion here. All you got to do is just kind of point the arrows the other direction. So let's say I've stored this waveform, this 4-bit waveform, in digital. All I would do is go ahead and put it into some sort of smoothing filter and potentially come out with something as opposed to that stair step. Have a very smooth-looking analog signal coming out, which I could, let's say, for example, it's music or human speech I could feed to a speaker and it would produce a reasonably accurate representation of that human speech or music. So this concludes the portion of the analog to digital conversion basics lecture. We're going to go ahead and move on to some specific methods for analog to digital conversion in the next lecture.